Hi gardeners. Today is Encore and more Flipgrid video day. Yay, we've all been waiting for it. I'm so excited to get these questions from our favorite Encore and more teachers. Here's what they have to say. Hi, Miss Kate, this is Mrs. Caird. I have a question for you. What is your favorite book to read when you are relaxing in the garden or sitting under a shady tree? Can't wait to hear all your answers. Oh, hi, Miss Caird. What a great question. My favorite books to read in the garden are a couple. I love Prodigal Summer by Barbara Kingsolver. It's a book I reread all the time. Same with River Teeth by David James Duncan. This is a collection of short stories that I read when I was rafting out west, and I've continued to read it because it makes me so happy. A book I love to read to my kids is The Circus Ship by Chris Van Dusen. This is a super fun book. Thank you so much for asking, Miss Karen. Great to see you. Hi, Miss Kate. My question is to you, does singing to your plants actually make them happier and make them grow? Does singing to your plants actually make them happier and make them grow? Thank you. I love you, a bushel and a peck, a bushel and a peck, and a hug around the neck. <gasps> uh. Hi, Mr. Clark. Maybe that was silly. I suppose that singing didn't make a plant magically appear. But singing does cause vibrations and plants respond to vibrations. There's not a lot of research, but it does sound like vibrations like sound, wind, and singing might impact the genes and growth in a plant. We don't know for sure, so I need some scientists to do some work on that. I have a theory though. Singing makes us happy and happy people can grow happy plants. So I think singing definitely makes your plants happy. Thanks, Mr. Clark. Hey, Ms. Kate, Mr. D here. I have a question for you. I get a lot of bananas from the grocery store every week. Is it possible for me to grow a banana tree here in Virginia so I can stop going to the grocery store so often? Hi, Mr. D, that's a really good question. Bananas do not normally grow here in Virginia. It's not hot enough unless you're in a greenhouse, just like right here at Lewis Skinner Botanical Gardens. Right behind us is a banana tree. Boys, point to the banana tree. At certain times of year, fruit will actually grow on the banana right here in the greenhouse, but it's not enough light yet. Thanks for your question. Bye. Hi, Miss Kate, it's Miss Fow. I had a really important question for you. We like to go hiking down by the James River and I'm wondering if you could talk to me more about poison ivy and what it looks like and why I shouldn't touch it. Thanks. Hi, Ms. Fout. Thanks for your question about poison ivy. Let's first talk about what is poison ivy? Poison ivy is a vine that can be found all across the continental United States. That means almost our entire country has poison ivy. Here are a few ways that you can identify poison ivy. Leaves of three, let it be, is true. Poison ivy grows in a cluster of three leaves. The leaves are pointy on the end and a little jagged along the edges. They also grow in alternating shoots along the vine. That means the shoots aren't side by side. It means they grow one and then another and then another and then another. And you can also see that the middle leaf in that cluster of three is a little bit bigger than the two side ones. The stem is reddish and there are never thorns. Sometimes you'll see that the vine is very hairy, especially when it's climbing up on a tree. There are even flowers and berries in certain times of year in certain locations. And in the springtime, the leaves are glossy and red. In the fall, the leaves turn yellow, orange, or red. Now, the reason that poison ivy is such a problem is that it makes us itchy. It has a chemical in the leaves that can get on our skin and cause us to be itchy. The best way to handle poison ivy, if you think you've been around it, is to wash your hands and wash your clothes. 
it can spread on objects like your dog's fur or your shoes. So again, if you think any of those objects have been around poison ivy, go ahead and wash your hands and wash your dog and wash your shoes and wash your clothes. I hope everyone stays safe. I hope you don't touch poison ivy, but if you do, you now know how to identify it and what to do when you touch it. Thanks again, Ms. Fout. Hi, Ms. Kate, it's Ms. Hooker. In one of your videos, you mentioned edible flowers. Can you tell us more about those? Are all flowers edible or will some hurt me? How do I cook them? I can't wait to hear all of your answers. Thanks. Hi, Ms. Hooker. Thanks for your question about edible flowers. There is a lot to learn about edible flowers. And when I wanna learn something, the best place to look is a book. There's a great resource if you have a Richmond City Public Library card, and that is called Hoopla. Hoopladigital.com is a free service you can use if you have a library card. There are a lot of books on Hoopla, and I found some about edible flowers. Let's take a look. Here I am on hoopladigital.com and I searched for books about edible flowers and I found this really great one called Southeast Foraging and it has a ton of information. So I went ahead and I found some of my favorite things. Here are two chapters and I'm going to go to contents and look at all of these edible things that we can find right here in Virginia. A couple of my favorites that we could find in the garden are dandelion. This tells us how we can identify the dandelion, where we can find it, how to harvest it, and it also tells us how to eat it. So dandelions, the young leaves can be eaten raw in salads or cooked. The open flowers are appealing garnishes. They can be made into wine and you can batter them and fry them too. Then unopened flower buds can be pickled like capers. The roots are most commonly roasted in the oven and then ground to make a coffee substitute. After roasting, they can also be used in a base flavor in soups, salads, and desserts. Another common thing we could find in the garden is henbit. A lot of people think this is a weed, but we could use it in salads. It holds up well in cooking. The stems are crunchy and the mild leaves have a ruffled, chewy texture. Another one that we could find in the garden is red buds. There are red bud trees blossoming right now. You can eat these buds um, when they are still tight and they have a sweet flavor. It's also important to note that there are some edible flowers that look like flowers that we should not eat. An example of that is wild carrot. Wild carrot is beautiful. Some people call it Queen Anne's lace and it is edible, but there are some that look like Queen Anne's lace that we should not eat. For example, Poison hemlock. It looks similar. The stems look a little similar. The flowers look very similar. This is the Queen Anne's lace or the wild carrot. This is the hemlock. There are some differences. The flower heads on the hemlock are smaller and there are more of them. There's one primary for the wild carrot but it's really, really important that you know what you're eating before you eat it. So always ask someone if you're unsure. Thanks again for your question. Those are a really good one. I hope you look up this book on Hoopla and I hope you go to your library and find some more books and share them with me. Thanks. Hi, Miss Kate, it's Miss James. And I was wondering what types of plants and flowers help us with stress and anxiety? Hi, Miss James. Yes, the garden has some really great plants to help with stress and anxiety. Lemon balm is a wonderful herb that smells like, you guessed it, lemon. It's a little fuzzy. It's uh, related to mint. You can use it in tea or as an essential oil. 
Another stress relieving herb we have in the garden is chamomile. It's not growing yet. It grows a little later in the spring and early summer. This I harvested from last year. The flowers you ground into small pieces and you can use it as a tea to help with your stress. Mint is a wonderful stress relieving herb. You can use it in tea or also essential oil. It even helps if you have an upset stomach. It smells so good. There's really nothing like being in a beautiful place to calm your mind and restore your soul. Right here at the garden is one of those places that really helps me to relax. Hey, Miss Kate. Mr. D here again. I've noticed my plants tend to be pretty lazy. They just like to sit around all day. They don't do anything. Is there any way I can make my plants exercise and be active? I mean, anything? Thanks for the help. This is Bob, Ball Breaker reporting. I'm breaking news that I just found out that plants can move. Reporting from the field is muddy gold. Thanks, Bob. I'm here in the field, and as you can see behind me, these plants are moving. You wouldn't know it with the naked eye, but if you do a time-lapse video, which is a slow video over a long period of time, you can see these plants are opening and closing their leaves. This is amazing breaking news. Signing off. Mary Gold in the field. That was so much fun. A huge thank you to Miss James, Miss Hooker, Miss Fout, Miss Caird, Mr. D, and Mr. Clark. I had a blast. If you have any questions, leave them on Flipgrid, just like these teachers did. Also, make sure you check out the website in the games section for a poison ivy identification quiz. See how well you can do. I miss all of you. I hope you're all doing well. Eat your veggies and I look forward to seeing you.